Lugs, what is up, man? How are you? Good morning. How are you guys doing? Doing awesome. Uh, he is on good. the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline, and you got a good look at Penn State. Now, I know you haven't seen Auburn mm-hmm. in person, but you have Penn State. It's a big game, obviously, for Auburn this weekend. Uh, what yeah. did you take away from your time watching the Nittany Lions? I think they're really talented. I believe they're really deep at multiple spots. Um, They have some concerns right now in the offensive line in terms of consistent performance. Um, You know, they made an emphasis in the offseason. Mike Yurcich, the offensive coordinator, and and James Franklin really made it a point of emphasis to, to line up and run the football. And if you watch the early portion of the Purdue game, it was almost like they were running it to the point of stubbornness just because they're trying to send a message to the offensive line. We saw more of that versus Ohio last week, although a lesser opponent. Um, They're really talented at running back. Um, Nick Singleton, Catron Allen, two true freshmen, Kevon Lee, three-headed monster in the backfield. Mitchell Tinsley, the wide receiver from Western Kentucky, is a a big-time player. And if Sean Clifford stays healthy, guys, I think we've all seen – what he can do defensively, they've, they've got plenty of guys up front uh, led by P.J. Mustafer. May have what I think is the best corner by the end of the season in all of college football. Joey Porter Jr., wow. 6'2 half, 190 pounds. Everybody's throwing away from him. And if you watch the Purdue game, you'll see what I was uh, talking about. So for me, I, I think it's really important that Auburn's defensive front in this matchup really try to come after um Penn State because what I've seen in two weeks from Penn State in the offensive line is is they struggle with multiple looks they struggle with pressure packages uh Ohio was able to get to Sean Clifford multiple occasions uh last week and we'll see uh if 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 Auburn can do that from a defensive perspective what type of answer will Auburn have at quarterback to Penn State Sean Clifford if you were guessing how do you think this game plays out Probably a little bit back and forth. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's one of those games where top to bottom Penn State may be a bit more talented and obviously has a much more secure answer at quarterback. For me, and I think James Franklin was very smart about this. I don't know if you guys saw kind of the news coming out of, of State College, but he's trying to paint the picture of what playing at Auburn is going to be like. And, um, and I think a lot of this is going to be how do you handle the environment? They handled Purdue on the road in a conference game to open up the week, hostile environment, but Purdue's not Auburn. And I think that um, that's going to play a huge role. And if it leads to some Penn State mistakes, then the question becomes, can, can Auburn actually capitalize on those mistakes, turn them into points, get their defense on a long field, hopefully have the offense on a short field, um, and then the quarterback again is going to have to outplay Sean Clifford. Yeah, interesting game, 2.30 at Jordan here this week, Penn State and Auburn. You know, Drew Drew Sanders had such a great game for Arkansas and a big one against South Carolina this past week. Uh, talk to me a little bit about Drew Sanders and that Arkansas defense, but start off by, I mean, you evaluate talent as good as anybody mm-hmm. in America. That Alabama linebacker room at one point had Drew yeah. Sanders at Arkansas, Shane Lee, who's having a great year out at USC, Toa Toa, who came in, Will Anderson, Dallas Turner, uh, Moody's playing great. That was a pretty good linebacker room at one point in Tuscaloosa, huh? Yeah, they, they can't all get on the field at the same time. And then you have the Kevin Harris kid, who was kind of a linebacker DN tweener. He's now at Georgia Tech. So that was a very, very crowded, talented room. Um, listen, I, I just think that Barry Odom has a group that plays hard, plays tough. They know what they are. They know they're going to go into every met- matchup and they're going to send a physical message. And if you're, and we saw that last year, if you remember week two against Texas last year and Arkansas just beat Texas up badly. Um, and I had the game the next week and Texas was able to respond, but Texas tech wasn't, wasn't Arkansas. And so I think they don't make a lot of mistakes. Uh, they, they play within themselves by and large. They keep the ball in front of them. And I think they're a pretty good tackling football team. And, and I say that because you look across the landscape of college football and how hard tackling has become and how to consistently tackle, especially what offenses have become. But you sit there and say, well, no wonder why, why that is. We're so concerned about player safety, and we should be, that we don't practice tackling during the week. And then all of a sudden, it's 100 miles an hour on game day, and we're expecting these guys to go out and be great tacklers. And it doesn't necessarily work that way. It's, it's not professional football. So – 
I've been impressed with how physical and tough they've been in game instances and their ability to tackle when it's tough to practice that way each and every day. ESPN's Tom Lugabill is with us on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. Uh, when you watched the tape of Alabama uh, against Texas, what jumps out at you about Alabama's offense? I know you were eavesdropping in our last segment. <laughs> Alabama can't take the top off a of defense right now. Do you think JoJo Earl and Tyler Harrell coming back potentially at the beginning of October can help with that? Yes, I, I think it, it allows them to have some more weapons on the field that when they break the huddle, or their little sugar huddle, whatever you want to call it. Um, defensively, people may look at them a little differently. I mean, I think we all would agree that Jameer Gibbs can't be your leading receiver and have this be sustainable for an extended period of time. Um, I was a little, I was a little surprised to see how how Alabama didn't continue to try and physically just go downhill uh, in the run game against Texas. Got away from the run game, you know, fairly early. But I got to credit Texas in that regard. Um, they didn't play scared. They, they didn't play like they were outmanned, even if maybe they were to some degree. They played aggressive. They were disruptive. They decided to attack and come after Alabama, not just sit back and say, okay, you know, we can't afford to give up the big play. And in doing so, they created some havoc. They created some confusion. I think they created some indecisiveness at times with, with Alabama's um, offense. But there, there's no question that, you know, I look at this receiver core, and it's a talented yet young and inexperienced receiver core. And in years past, when we've seen maybe as a collective group with Alabama, there always seems to be that one holdover from the year before that was an established guy, right? And then you blended some of the other younger guys in with that established guy. And so while people were maybe paying attention to a Jerry Judy or a Calvin Ridley or a John Metchie or a Jalen Waddell, you could kind of bring those other guys along. Instead, this year, it's kind of everybody knew at once. And so that might take a little bit of a little bit of time to gel. But the bottom line is, guys, I mean, I, I think we all have knee-jerk reactions. We all become prisoners of the moment. They went and played in front of 105,000 people and didn't play a very good game. All right. 15 penalties, didn't play overly well in the offensive line. Um, and we're able to somehow win the game. And I think that's the focus here if you're an Alabama fan, because we've seen this before, guys. We've seen Alabama <laughs> go get beat or narrowly escape. And then what ends up happening? It's the rest of the conference's worst nightmare because they go scorched earth. Uh, based on the guys you saw in high school, more surprising, the way Quinn Ewers played uh, cool and collective in that limited time against Alabama or how pedestrian Haynes King has been for Texas A&M? Oh, how pedestrian Haynes King has been. And I'm not so sure, though, that's all Haynes King. I, I also think a little bit of that is just a stubbornness and an unwillingness of Jimbo Fisher to evolve and to become more creative, become more of an attacking style of football team. I, I don't want to sit there and make it sound like we're saying, hey, join the rest of college football because there's a bunch of different ways um, to, to skin a cat. But um, they just they're, – they're very, very vanilla. And, it, guys, the bottom line is – it's not so much that Texas A&M lost that game. It's how they lost the game. I mean, App State beat them up, up front on both sides of the ball, and there were there were no answers. And, and so you're looking at App State, the 10-win team off of a, a season ago, played in the Sun Belt Championship. They're, they're kind of the Boise State of the East Coast, if you will. So for them to go in and compete, I get. Um, are there any excuses for losing that game for Texas A&M? No, but it's how they lost it that I think A&M fans should be disturbed about. Um, any concern at all about Ole Miss going to play Georgia Tech? You saw that Georgia Tech team, yeah. uh, that defense, you know, didn't play horrible against Clemson. The yeah. offense struggled. Ole Miss is struggling at quarterback right now. That's an interesting game to me this weekend. It's actually my game. I'm oh. uh, looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to it as well. Uh, ABC 330, a little shameless plug there for you. Yeah. Um, I am very interested to see, because this is transfer you versus transfer you, right? Right. You've got Ole Miss with 24 transfer portal guys. You've got Georgia Tech with 17 transfer portal guys. Um, you have a quarterback battle where I actually think both guys at Ole Miss are very, very talented. Just one hasn't just grabbed those reins and pulled back and said, hey, let's go. Um, I'm supposed to talk to, to Lane here in a couple of hours and kind of get his sense of, of what they're thinking. But – they're the, to this point on film, and I know they've only played Troy and then they played Central Arkansas this past week. 
The transfer portal guys, though, that Ole Miss took are as advertised. Zach Evans is a dude, all right? Jalen Robinson from UCF is a dude. J.J. Pegues from Auburn, he's a guy. Kari Coleman, the linebacker from TCU, made a ton of plays the last two weeks. So they've made good choices in that regard. I think they're better in the offensive line than maybe they thought they'd be through a couple of weeks. But I, it's my belief that eventually this is going to be Jackson Dart's job. He has at least statistically played better in the first two weeks than Luke Altmaier did. And Luke Altmaier got banged up versus Central Arkansas. So you got a bunch of new guys, haven't played on the road, haven't done a, a road environment in terms of schedule and how they do things there at Ole Miss. I know Lane Kiffin talked about that earlier in the week. There's going to be a lot of firsts for Ole Miss. And then, you know, Tech played good on defense against Clemson. You're right. And at times played well um, on offense, moved the ball, a lot of self-inflicted wounds, two blocked punts last week versus Western Carolina. I know it's Western Carolina, but Georgia Tech did not have a false start didn't have any kicking game snafus. So uh, maybe if the fans show up at Bobby Dodd Stadium, this turns to a little more of a competitive match than people think. Uh, again, 2.30 Central, 3.30 Eastern on ABC, Luke's game this week. Uh, I don't have my decoder ring today. Just help me out here. You said one guy, he's a dude. Another guy, he's a dude. The third guy, he's a guy. Now, does dude mean better than guy <laughs> or is guy better than dude? Is it dude then I'll, guy? I'll, I would hear if, if guy and dude, I think would be the same. Now, if you hear me say Jag, yeah, which stands, which stands for just a guy. Yeah. That's bad. That's bad. Just a guy. So you can be a, a guy, but if you're a Jag, yeah. that's, that's bad. That's right. Or if you suffer from loft, you guys know what loft is? I do not. Yeah. It's a lack of freaking talent. Yes. That's what you don't want to suffer from. <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. ever suffer from loft. Yeah. My wife literally said last night, you're a loft ass. Lack, <laughs> lack of freaking talent. No doubt about it. Uh, so we got dude, guy, jag, right? Yeah, okay. Yes, all right. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's what you And all doing. three of you are collective loft. Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. no doubt about that. That's Could have been the name of the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Had we yeah. known that in advance, yes. we would have done it. The loft. Yep. All right. Uh, he is ESP. It's Tom Luganbill, as Dunaway said. You can see him on Miss Georgia Tech 230 ABC 3340. He joins us each week at this time. Thank you, Lugs. Enjoy uh, Atlanta. Will do. Have a good one, guys. All right, buddy. Take care. Lugabill with us on the Johnston RV Center.com hotline. <laughs>